correctly. I haven't done the spaces in a while. Um, thank you guys for for all logging on. I'm sure more people will come. I know it's only a couple minutes after four. Um, people are also busy this weekend after Thanksgiving. So thank, thanks for getting on. Um, there's obviously a ton of interest in the Idaho college students murdered. Uh, I've been reading about it, following it as closely as I can for the last couple of weeks. I wanted to get out there sooner, but I had some family commitments and, and stuff that came up. Um, and I just come off of a, like a month traveling for work. So unfortunately, I'm not able to go out there until tomorrow. Finally, tomorrow, I'm going to travel um, to Idaho. News Nation um, has had other reporters on the story. There's been a ton of other media out there, a lot of really good reporting that's that's been going on. Um, and I've been trying to stay on top of most of it, but I'm I'm happy that we're finally able, my team is finally able to go out tomorrow just because it'll be two weeks since um, since it happened. And, you know, all of us who cover these cases know that, you know, after a couple of weeks, sometimes, um, you know, people start to lose interest and it's just good to keep the pressure on, keep visibility on something like this you know, let the world know that there's still a lot of interest and that everyone is watching just to kind of keep the tips coming in. And, um, you know, I, police already seem obviously really, really passionate about solving it. But also, I just think it's important to, to keep it in the news. So we're going to be going out to Idaho tomorrow. And I just wanted to do the spaces um, to sort of talk with everyone, kind of to go over the latest that we know. There's obviously a lot of information we don't know. Um, and, um, and also just get information from you guys. I mean, I want to, I want you guys to talk and we'll hear from Jennifer Koffendoffer and, um, producer Paige, who I work with, uh, at News Nation, who's been on this since the beginning. Uh, again, News Nation has had people out there, just, just not me. Um, and just, you know, I, I'm going to be taking notes throughout, um, just, just for stuff, for stuff to, for us to look into when, uh, when we go out there. Obviously our main focus is just covering the story, like I said, keeping visibility um, on what happened and, um, you know, keeping it in the news, because I think that's really important. I mean, we're not police, obviously, um, and that's not our role. Um, but, you know, there are obviously things that we can look into. And we know from other cases that we've covered a lot of times information that comes to the media, um, you know, ends up helping law enforcement and, you know, all the, the people on Twitter and online. I mean, we know from other cases have had big um have had a big impact in, in, in solving other cases. So everybody sort of has an important role. Um, Jennifer and Paige, are you guys there? Yes. Hey, Paige. how are you guys? That's Paige. Hey, Jennifer. Doing great. How are you doing, Brian? Hi, Paige. How was your, um, how was your Thanksgiving, Jennifer? Oh, it's always great when the family's all together. How about yours? It was good. It was good. Um, it was good, you know, ate a lot. You know, just it's nice to be with the family and everything. Um, how was yours, Paige? It was really good. I got to come to my hometown, spend some time with family. Uh, the only difference from you guys is I had about 40 degree weather um, instead of some nice summer sunshine, <laughs> like we would call it up here. Yeah, oh, that's true. Flo I... uh, Jennifer and I are both in Florida, so we're uh, a little spoiled in that department. We are spoiled especially growing up where it was freezing cold and now I'm warm every day. It's kind of nice. Did you make the, I remember last year you made like all those pies, Jennifer. Yes. Uh, so this year, two pumpkins by request, but my younger son wanted a uh, brownie a la mode. So I made double fudge brownies with um, uh, chocolate chips also. So they were just oh gooey. God. and That and sounds amazing. <laughs> so that was fun and apple pie and then i have a cheesecake coming up but it's my mm -hmm. surprise oh that's like a a weekend after thanksgiving event the cheesecake well i'm doing that sunday as a special surprise so um it's got a uh, uh, five things of philly cheese in it eight eggs it takes me about five hours to make it's ridiculous but it's so good well, I'm glad we're doing the spaces today, so you'll have time. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, well, let's jump into it. Um, yes. I'll start with, with you, Jennifer. And we, we've got a ton of questions, and I'm going to go back through the thread from yesterday when I first posted about this and try to get a bunch of questions in. Um, but th I guess the first question I have, Jennifer, is, um, you know, we're, we're almost two weeks out now. There's not a lot of, inf like, official information from police. Are, do you think they know a lot more? Then they're letting on, or do you get the feeling that this is that this is really almost like a cold case at this point? 
I think, Brian, they have a lot of information and they have so much more to go through. Uh, I saw on there somebody asked for a percentage of what was probably returned. And I think it's a very low percentage, both in terms of subpoena returns. I think the laboratory information is extremely small in terms of returns forensically. I think the forensic analysis of telephones and uh, the cell tower information, all of that is probably really almost at its infancy, even though it's going to have an emergency uh, request on them. It just takes time. Um, so I think that sadly, because it's not someone in the inner circle, that that's the reason why this is taking so long to get a suspect named. And Jennifer, we just got the new information from police this morning. Um, they're talking now more than 260 digital media submissions. Uh, they say 113 pieces of physical evidence that they've collected and sent to the Idaho State Police Crime Lab. That 113, someone asked me that on Twitter today. That number for that type of a, of a scene, is that big? Is that small? Is that what you expect? I would expect something in line with that because you're looking at really, uh, I don't want to say four crime scenes. It's it's such a huge crime scene. You have the bedrooms, maybe only two, maybe three in play. You have the uh, area where the person would have entered. Uh, you have that general space. You have the stairwell. Trace evidence can be left anywhere in those formats. And then you have everything outside, you know, how he entered. Was he in that brush area? I posted something on Twitter where I saw um, agents that appeared to be looking to see what their vantage point would be from the woods. And then I saw another agent on the very peripheral running. And I was wondering if possibly they're timing something and looking at vantage points. So there is so much evidence that could be strewn for quite a lot large area. So no, I'm not surprised, Paige. And you mentioned, um, someone getting in. I mean, I heard one of the, the family members say that there was a, a code on the front door. And then we've heard from police that there was no forced entry. Um, I mean, does, what do you think that means? Is it, is it someone, I mean, you mentioned you don't think it's someone on the inner circle, but it, it seems like it would be someone who knew how to get in without, you know, breaking a window or something. I think it's going to be somebody comfortable that maybe has even been in their house before at one of these parties. I think uh, to have this brazen of a move uh, to go into that house. Uh, but I believe they probably entered through the sliding glass door, which is on the second story, which was uh, apparently oftentimes left open. And it makes most sense that that is how the person entered. When they t talk about um, the people who were in the house, the other roommates being, I don't know if they use the word cleared, but basically saying, you know, that they're not the focus of the investigation right now. Um, I was wondering, like, is what, when law enforcement says that, can that sometimes be like a tactic? Like they are secretly still, you know, possibly a suspect, or does that really mean they don't think that they were involved in terms of like the other roommates? In this case, I believe law enforcement is absolutely clearing these individuals. I think that they want people to focus in terms of the public's help on this, not to be focused on individuals that they've cleared and they don't feel are responsible. And those are usually cleared this quickly by concrete alibi. Interesting. OK, so you think it's legit when they say that? I really do. I don't think the police are playing games at this point. They are seeking the public's help with not only camera footage, ring camera, but also remember somebody who did this would have returned to where they reside, um, probably very bloodied, very disheveled, very tired. Um, somebody who is capable of this probably has uh, lost their temper in the past. Um, I think it's somebody that was at least in the community during this time frame, maybe because it's break right now, they're out of this community. But, you know, there are people that are going to be in and around their inner circle that probably would have seen signs of uh, this person being capable of this. And Brian, to Jennifer's point a little bit too, 
you know, police keep emphasizing over and over again, that window of time, that 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. where they want to see surveillance video and images. And you and I were talking about this on the phone earlier. But what's really interesting to me is they keep saying it's super important for what we see in that video, but also what we don't see, what's missing from there. Uh, maybe it's a break in a routine or a pattern or something like that that will catch their attention. So like even if you have video from that time that you don't think shows anything, what are they saying? It's, it, would, it could still be useful? Yeah, they're saying even if there's no movement in this video, even if you say to yourself, I don't think I don't see anything, they still want you to send it to them um, because they say what they don't see could actually be very telling of certain things they're looking at as well. Interesting. I guess that makes sense, huh, Jennifer? Yeah, I, I think it's different things like uh, uh, things that might be out of place that to somebody that just had a ring camera and doesn't see anything obvious. But to police, uh, there might be something obvious in that video. Um, uh, let me just give you an example. And this is just hypothetical. I'm not saying this occurred, but say the individual actually dropped something, um, something they ate, uh, something, uh, a glove, anything like that they might not even notice that in that ring video that comes up as a speck, you know, across the street. Uh, but then it becomes noticeable because remember they didn't just show up. There has to be an egress uh, point and a point that they entered uh, this whole scene. And it has just uh, boggles me uh, that uh, we don't have any camera footage yet, or at least that that's not become public. So maybe they're holding that close to the vest. I wonder, too, with it being a small town and we've heard uh, the police say in some of the press conferences that, you know, stuff like this doesn't happen there, that people let their guards down because it's such a quiet town. Like I have found covering stories in the past when you go to towns like that, they don't have all the video cameras everywhere. Because, like, I mean, I live in Miami and like everybody has a ring camera. If something happens, you're going to find video. But in some of these towns, you know, that might not be the case. I think that is a very legitimate point. Uh, growing up in a small farm town myself, uh, when I go back, everybody's door is still open. My parents don't lock their doors. Uh, no one does. It's very trusting. They don't have a ring camera. Um, so I think you make a very, very valid point. Yeah, that might be part of the reason they, or maybe they, they do have the video and some video and they just haven't told us. Um, a lot. So a lot of the comments are about the 911 call um page um so so we know that there's a 911 call but they they they've adamantly not released it right right we've got no 911 call it's better off talking about what we actually know about the 911 call so we we haven't heard it yet we don't have a transcript yet we know that it came around just before noon uh on the 13th and it came from a cell phone belonging to one of the surviving roommates and police have over and over again not released the name of who made the 911 call uh, but most recently in one of their more recent press conferences and then follow up releases that they share after that uh they said the call once again belonged to the roommate's phone. Multiple people talked to the dispatcher, uh, but there were other people at the house on the time the 911 call was made. Police say the roommates called friends over because they thought that there were people passed out on the second floor and, the, and that they weren't waking up. So that kind of explains the call for the unconscious person. Mm -hmm. We know police arrived shortly after that to what they found. So what do you make? Jennifer of them I mean to me it doesn't seem unusual that they're not releasing the call because when we've covered other cases and it's like an, a really active investigation they can you know they can hold that back from making public what, what do you make of it yeah I think they've held it back very purposefully uh, I think it, it discloses the people that were involved in making that call I don't think they want their names out there. They don't want them contacted. Uh, they are key. Uh, they're going to be key in this case in terms of witnesses, uh, maybe obviously not to the crime, but to the aftermath of the crime. I think the reason that we're seeing um, unconscious person, which, you know, if you walked into a situation like that, it would seemingly be quite a bloodbath and not just an unconscious person. But and I don't know this to be true, but if their doors were locked and they were banging on those doors and getting no response or door, um, 
that could very possibly be why. Um, I've also seen a rumor, and I have not seen it substantiated, uh, that someone looked in there and then walked out and collapsed, and that was the person they were reporting. I don't really think that makes much sense just to debunk that rumor, although I always say if, if there's some truth to that, please come forward and, and let us know the source of those remarks. Well, a lot of the comments from people, and I, I get it, it's, it's hard to visualize four people being stabbed, you know, separately at different times, assuming it's the same one killer. Um, and, you know, and no one in the house waking up or they're not being like screaming. But at the same time, I mean, if, if everybody's, I don't know, if, if you've been drinking and you're like in a deep sleep or passed out or I mean, who knows what the situation was like. But I get why people are saying it's just weird that, you know, that no one would have heard anything or no, or woken up. Well, for, for those that might even be on this spaces, and certainly for those in the public who have been viciously attacked, even if they were awake, if they were surprised, and I can speak from experience on this, it happens in milliseconds. Um, they're on you, they're attacking you, and certainly somebody with a knife, uh, you know, one plunge to your lung area, to your larynx, and there's no screaming. It happens so quickly. There's really no chance for a response, uh, especially with somebody who's possibly inebriated and sound asleep. That's a great point. Yeah, that is. Um, another big thing, I mean, and there's like, there's so little official information to even go on at this point, because there's just, there's not a lot that they've released. But in the beginning, page. I guess since the beginning, they've said this. I think they've been using the word targeted. Yes, since the very beginning. So, you know, this story came to be, and, and if, for those of you who follow the news closely, right around the time, exactly, you know, the same day as those three University of Virginia football players were shot. Um, so a lot of attention was on that story. We hear four people murdered, uh, four students in Idaho. Police say it's targeted. They tell the public you're not in danger. This is a targeted attack. We're investigating. And it is only until a couple days later when they have this, this pretty bombshell press conference where they say, hey, actually, you know, we do think that the public should be on alert. There could be some cause for right. concern. Now They, they kind of walked to, it back. They, they kind of like, walked it back yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And so they have maintained the entire time that it is targeted. Uh, most recently, uh, Wednesday, the chief, when we when we followed up on that, uh, exactly why, they point to evidence, they won't say what that is, and then they say, you're just going to have to trust us at this point in the game. But how much of that do you think is them having to balance out keeping people calm? You have a university in your town, school supposed to be back in session. I mean, you can't have the whole world or the whole town in a panic. Yeah, it's I mean, like they, they want to be honest, but at the same time, like, you know, yeah, we've they don't talked want to parents who are like, I told, them. yeah, we've talked to parents who are like, I called my kid up and I said, you're coming home for Thanksgiving early. I mean, yeah, this is, this is the first murder in this town in, in, I think they said seven years. Um, it's pretty much spooked everybody there. So I think you're right. It's, it's something delicate to balance. Yeah, and there's been a couple of parents that DM'd me and said that they weren't going to let their kids go back to school because school starts again on Monday. Um, the school, the university put out a, a statement saying that they will make it an option for every class, whether you want to go back in person or you can continue online if you don't feel safe. And I saw there were even some professors that have said, um, I'm not even offering the in-person um option right now. I don't, I don't think it's appropriate given that there's, you know, a killer on the run. Jennifer, what do, what do you make of this whole, a lot of it seems like semantics, but the fact that they're using the word targeted. I believe that police believe it truly was targeted. Uh, in other words, there was an individual, and I think it's just one, specifically targeted in the that there is a balancing act so you don't have panic on your hands. But I think they have strong evidence because they have not wavered from that. 
And my belief is, is a, I mean, I hate to even say it, but I'm just speaking um, from other circumstances. I think it's going to be um, a possible real mutilation, decapitation of the individual that was targeted compared to others that were really just in their way um, and that they got through to get to their true target. I'm so sorry to mention things like that on here, but I just think that that's what we're looking at. Well, and there was, so it's interesting on these, the press releases that they send out are very detailed, but there's not a lot of new information. But I mean, they're, you know, they, they're very, um, again, so whoever is in charge of their press kind of knows what they're doing in the way that they're putting these releases together. With, and they even have a section that says rumor control. Um, so every time they put out a release, there's a whole little part where it says rumor control, and they address some of the rumors. And, and I'm trying to find it now. Uh, online reports of the victims being tied and gagged are not accurate. Okay, so it didn't say anything about mutilation um, not being accurate. They, they were just very clear about the, the tied and gagged, because that became a rumor at one point. They say the tied and gagged is not accurate. Yeah, and that was just the start of a of a number of series of rumors here. I'm going to read some of them off in addition, Brian. Uh, the report of the dog that was skinned a few months back, just about three miles from the home. Police say they've ruled that out. That's not connected. You guys may have heard it was brought up in the most recent press conference. A 2021 double stabbing in Salem, Oregon um, showed some similarities. They say that's not. Their evidence doesn't suggest that's connected. Nor a 1999 a Pullman, Washington stabbing. They say that's not connected. Uh, the one interesting one, uh, they haven't gone as far as completely blocked it out, but the idea of one of the victims, Kaylee, having a stalker, uh, they say they've heard a, a lot about that, um, brought up in terms of tips, uh, but no evidence yet. But they said that doesn't mean they're going to stop looking at that idea. And just when I put on my reporter hat for these kinds of stories, like in my mind, I'm always trying to think about what the police are thinking behind the scenes. Like there's reasons that they release certain things and reasons they don't. Just like when we're reporting, um, there are certain times where like if we might find out something and find out the police, and that hasn't happened in this case, obviously, but other times it has where we found out something that the police are really close to solving something and, and they will ask us to hold back that information, you know, give us 24 hours, you'll totally compromise the investigation if you if you report this now. And usually if, if you know, they're that close, we don't want to compromise the investigation so we won't report it, you know. But anyway, what I'm thinking about is like with the rumor control and with the, the choice of what they're releasing and not releasing, um, it's just interesting to think about how much they might know um, and not that they would be trying to mislead us or the public, but but their main mission is not keeping us informed right now. Their main mission is finding the killer. So th th there could just be a lot going on behind the scenes. And we know from from covering this and talking to investigators after the fact with other cases that, you know, oftentimes the, the media people are not kept in the loop with the sensitive information. A lot of times the detectives talking to the family members are not kept in the loop with the sensitive information, again, as a way to sort of protect the core of the investigation. So I don't know, like everything I read, I'm trying to think about what could could actually be going on. Yeah, and then going back to kind of what we do know or what they've been transparent about from the beginning is the murder weapon, right? It started as like a sharp edged object and very quickly they said, we're looking for a knife. We're not looking for any sort of knife. We're looking for a big knife, a fixed blade knife. We've been reaching out to all these stores in the area that might sell them. Uh, Jennifer, this is more for you, but, you know, we spoke with Tracy Walder. She's a former FBI agent and CIA friend of News Nation. Uh, on, on the show earlier this week, she said she's not that concerned about the weapons, about finding the weapon. She says there's a lot more valuable stuff out there. I'm curious your take. I disagree with her. Um, that weapon is so important. Um, as I said, uh, uh, I think previously making other comments, if they find that weapon, they are going to find so much information on that weapon. They're going to be able to trace back the location where that weapon was found and go backwards to find uh, the individual that may have used it. I think it's um, a crucial piece of the evidence. It's also 
uh, once they just once they figure out a subject, that's going to help link that subject. It is very difficult uh, to make cases often when uh, we don't have the murder weapon, whether that's a gun or where in this case is it a fixed blade knife. Uh, I also think the knife is going to help solve the crime from the standpoint of the individual who committed this crime, I believe is comfortable with knives. I believe um, they chose that knife as their uh, weapon for a reason. It's very personal. It's, um, uh, you know, the way the knife just enters the body, what's involved after is all very vicious. And I think that that is going to help find the killer. It's so brutal. I mean, I don't want to get, you know, too gross and graphic, but you're right. I mean, it's, I think that's why this case is so disturbing to so many people and why parents are afraid to send their kids back on Monday and all of that is because, I mean, it's not just one young person stabbed, but to think about the fact that four people and that this person, assuming it's one person, had to go through um, the house and do that. Something else that I wanted to ask you about, Jennifer, um, is a lot of people are asking, why is there not a reward? Um, like, why are they not announcing some kind of big reward? They announced that the governor um, in Idaho was giving a million additional dollars to help with the investigation. But does it mean anything that they're not offering a reward? Like, could that mean that they that they know who it is? I don't believe they know who it is. Um, I say that because if they did know, I think that they would want to let the public know uh, because of all the concern and, uh, you know, the way this is going with uh, people believing the police aren't doing, you know, a good enough job. Here it is, you know, two weeks. And um the reward situation is interesting. Of course, getting a million dollars, they're not concerned about that. Plus all the individuals uh, that are um, contributing in terms of these other law enforcement agencies. But of course, where a reward comes in very importantly in these cases is sometimes people will come forward with a reward. So I am surprised. I don't know why nobody's taking the lead on that to offer or to collect and to offer a very substantial reward. Um, I find it uh, surprising, but I think it's going to change. I think we will see a reward in the future. I just hope it doesn't. I mean, obviously like everyone, I, I hope that, that, that there's not a huge future in terms of it remaining unsolved. I mean, cause you know how it is that the longer it goes on, they always say like the first 48 hours is the most important. And now, you know, we're almost two weeks out. Um, I, I, I would hate to be covering this in a year and, you know, still having these conversations. And you feel for the families, right? Who are yeah. obviously trying to process something unimaginable, but then not having the full picture as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and, and again, I've seen some frustration from them um, in some interviews that they've done about you know, a lack of information and that kind of thing. But it's just, again, it seems like it's such a fine line, um, you know, a tightrope almost like that the, the police are on because it, it seems like they don't even tell the families what they know at, at, at a phase like this. Right, Jennifer? Yeah, I think Jennifer could probably speak more to that as well. But it's kind of this, like, this line you're trying to balance of the, we're all thinking about like finding out who did this and finding answers, but law enforcement is thinking about building and executing and prosecuting a case. Yeah. And the prosecution piece of this is huge and they're protecting that from stage one moving forward. I mean, to release any particular details about that crime scene or exactly what happened can completely uh, whitewash uh, once they actually get a subject and um, are building from that. Um, so they, they just can't. It would just uh, totally upend the integrity of this case for them to release a lot of details. And I feel for the families and friends too, because when something like this happens, and again, from having covered other stories, you know, as amazing as the internet sleuths are, um, it's at the same time, like people dig up information on everyone. And, and a lot of, you know, most of the people aren't involved at all. And then people come up with theories and, um, and, you know, I just feel for the people that, um, 
get, you know, kind of squashed in the middle of this that had nothing to do with it. And suddenly, you know, they become suspects and in the eyes of people on the internet. Um, It's just, you know, I don't know. That always makes me feel bad too. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Jack D, you know, we have three Jacks, but if you look at Jack D, the ex-boyfriend, he was being completely maligned on all social media forums and I know I, I sent out two tweets just hoping people would get the word out. He is not the subject and the the and, and in fact been cleared and law enforcement uh, said that w- very early on, um, you know, within days, one of their uh, early on press conferences. And it's so interesting because it only takes a few people to get that and to breed that. And right. it just, and I feel terrible for for the poor kid. Yeah. At the same time, though, I mean, a lot of people are DMing me, and usually I'll just tell people to send it to the police, too. Um, but, you know, it's the internet sleuths that that take the time to go back through old posts and find people who liked those posts and then go look at those people and see, oh, this person, like, has bloody photos from, you know, a crazy movie. And then it, like... Uh, I don't know that there's enough people within the police department to be doing that 24 seven. And a lot of times those little pieces of information actually do help. Well, you think about in the Gabby Petito case, the video that spotted the van, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. If it wasn't for those people just going back and looking at their dash cam, um, that's pretty much what, you know, brought that whole case together. So I think, you know, you just hope most people do it responsibly. Cause again, I, I always just feel bad for the people that get thrown under the bus that really have nothing to do with it. You know? Well, you know, Brian, I'm a huge, uh, sleuth fan, uh, yeah, from the standpoint, too. you know, they, they, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the time they take, most of them are, you know, very well educated. They have, uh, terrific jobs and, and what they do on the side is, is, is they sleuth and, uh, they're very good at it. And they find a lot of great details and and things that are helpful. I know I get DM'd uh, so often on cases all over the country. And when I see one that's a nugget, I mean, I'll call directly, you know, that agent on that case. Um, if the bureau is involved and if it's a local, I'll call them just to say, listen, please take a look at this. And I'll, you know, send it to them via text because, you know, it could be something that gets caught in the tip line and and isn't looked at for a long period of time. Right. Yeah, no, totally. And it's, it's, you know, everyone is sort of the eyes and ears, right? I mean, like I said, there's not enough police officers to catch everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, Paige, can you go through, um, or maybe Jennifer, but Paige, if if you happen to, to know it off the top of your head, like the video that we, that we know exists that, because the police, have they released some video? No. So basically the one video we have is that Twitch video uh, from the food truck. Um, I think it's called the grub truck. And that was the video that Kaylee's sister is actually credited with tracking down and finding um, and and giving to police. That's where Kaylee and Madison were. Uh, They put the timestamp police. This is now according to police at around 1 40 in the morning uh as a last stop potentially before they were driven home by a, a private party who's also been uh not considered someone they're looking into in this investigation as far as that a uh, police is are mainly focused on this grid that they've repeatedly shared um and it's that area specifically within within moscow it's it's obviously hard to show you guys because we can't physically show you guys here so i recommend going to their website um, but it's a grid that they pinpointed a specific area from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And that's where they want everything they can find in terms of surveillance. What have you made of that video, Jennifer? Well, when I when I looked at that video and I've looked at it uh, several times just to look at the key people in there. Right. So we started with a lot of people being concerned about the hooded man. Right. And, yeah. And oh, he, a lot of people are still talking about the hooded man. A lot yeah. of people, are, the hoodie guy, but the hoodie guy has been identified and has been cleared by law enforcement. So the hoodie guy is now out. Um, there are um, 
you know, you can tell these girls, they are having a great time. Uh, you know, they just left the bar. Uh, they're getting their food. They're, you know, they called the Uber. It's such a typical college, you know, scene and vibe. Um, there were a few things that were a little odd, you know, in terms of there's a lot of hugs going around. I did notice one individual that seemed kind of ignored um, in the video that I'm kind of just looking into just, you know, kind of just looking. I mean, I'm sure law enforcement has already identified him. Um, the slews have identified him and, you know, just kind of looking. But I, I have no doubt law enforcement is looking at that video and identifying each and every person in there, just like they need to do with the Sigma Chi house, you know, um, where Ethan and um, Zana were, because that's a big space of time we're missing. Yeah. Um, and what about the bar? I mean, wasn't there, a, there could be surveillance cameras where, you know, other places they were. Oh, I think they law enforcement has those and is yeah. pouring over those to see if there's anything unusual because something that night or possibly the day before, but, you know, ignited the anger in this person, the ire in this person to act that night and do this, you know, heinous crime. I'm yeah, and if we through, have yeah. anybody, oh sorry, oh, sorry Brian, right. I no, just no, want to go to the grid thing. If we have anybody on the spaces who is from Moscow or familiar with the area, the question I've had regarding to the grid that I've been talking about is what kind of area is that, Brian? Like when you get out there tomorrow, that's one of the things that that I'm interested in driving around. Is this grid they're looking for? Um, and they've identified it. These streets are there bars there? Is it residential? Um, what type of area is this? Is what I'm really curious to know. So I'm going to throw it out to the group for that. Yeah. If anyone is um, in uh, Moscow, um, I guess raise your hand and put a request and then I can unmute you. Again, I'm not the greatest with spaces. Um, one other question that just came in, um, Jennifer, is, and a lot of people keep using the, you know, phrase serial killer. Could it be, um, could it be a serial killer? Or since they're saying targeted, does that sort of rule that out? Could who be? I'm sorry. Could, could, could we be dealing? Oh, no, you're fine. Could we be dealing with the serial killer? Okay, I I don't believe so, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to trust law enforcement on this. I just don't think that if they had truly identified the markings of a serial killer, meaning um, a complete randomness. Did we lose Jennifer? Are you there, Paige? Did we lose her? I'm here. Did we lose her? Hold on. Let's see if she comes back. You know, Jennifer and her, uh, <laughs> she has she has cell phone issues sometimes. Meanwhile, my mom keeps, like, blowing up my phone during this. It's like, mom. <laughs> Is she saying anything nice? <laughs> no, she's, I don't even think she knows we're having the spaces. She's more worried about my sick dog. Um, yeah. Jennifer, hello? Are you there? We'll give Jennifer a second to come back. Well, Brian, I'm going to start asking you questions now. How about that in the meantime? Okay. Um, after reading about this and hearing from people, you and I have obviously been talking about this ourselves for a while. What are you most interested in when you get out there? Um, I mean, I mean, I'm, oh, you know how I am. Like once I get into it, like I can't help it. I just get like crazy obsessed and I know that's going to happen once I get out there. Um, like once, like boots on the ground kind of thing. I mean, I'm just interested in digging up anything that um, other reporters haven't found yet. Um, I mean, they would again without impeding the investigation. I mean, obviously, you want people to talk to the police first, but anything that we can help, um, you know, bring to light. I mean, no, uh, it'd be interesting to talk to the roommates. Um, obviously, getting the victim stories out there again, talking to their family members. I mean, that's really what it's all about. Um, yeah, I'm also interested in school starting again. I just how that's going to work with with a with a killer on the run and these these brutal brutal killings. Like, I, I mean, I understand why parents um, would be scared. You know, that makes sense to me. Right. I think for me too. I'm such like a visual, and I didn't know what Moscow I or who was before this. You know, so like I want to know more about the neighborhoods. And the areas that they would go out to and the routes they would go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. And I think I'm also just surprised that it still hasn't been 
solved. I mean, that, that like two weeks out, something this horrific um, with it's gotten so much attention too. I, I guess, and and again, maybe behind the scenes, there's more progress than we know of. But I, I think I'm just surprised that you know that that I'm going out tomorrow, two weeks out, and that there's still so little information officially. You know, right, right, totally. I mean, what was the most recent update of the sheer amount of manpower um, from from the FBI in addition to all law enforcement? I mean, there yeah. are hundreds. Yeah, Moscow police, um, I'm trying to look at the latest, it looks like they have four detectives, 24 patrol officers, and five support staff, and then they've got the um, the support of the FBI, uh, 22 investigators in Moscow, so they've got 22 people there, uh, 20 assigned agents throughout the U.S., two behavior analysis unit investigators, which is obviously important if they're trying to like profile who this person is. And then the Idaho State Police uh, is is obviously playing a big part. Twenty investigators in Moscow. Um, they've got the public information officer. It seems like they're handling the media a lot. Um, and then they've got a forensic services and mobile crime scene team. Fifteen uniformed troopers. Also, uh, we've heard that there's going to be a ton of uniformed police officers there starting on Monday just to make um, like the community and the students especially feel safe, which which makes sense. Right. Hold on, I'm trying to see if Jennifer's, where is she? Hold on. Jennifer, let's see if she's back. I'm going to text her. Hold on. <laughs> she's. Um, let's see. There she is. Oh, Jennifer, are you back? Hey, Jennifer, I apologize. You, I, you know, Brian, I can't remember the last time I did a space. I think it was with <laughs> you and Marky. This is why I seem to have technical difficulties. Um, you had asked me about whether I thought this was a serial killing. Did, they, yeah. did that come across? Uh, simply no, no, that's when you cut out. Because, and I mean, the reason I asked is because that's one of the top things that people are asking on, on Twitter. So I wanted to see what you think about it. Yeah, I, I don't. And I'm going to tell you why it's the trust that i have in law enforcement that they believe this is targeted for a very specific reason we don't know there could have even been a note left there could be different indications that they know from the media they've looked at already um that uh there was a specific threat so they are so adamant about it i think that that is the situation we're looking at i also looked closely at two other uh, murders that took place. Um, one was in, um, and I'm gonna butcher this, Washington, Washington, and another one in Oregon uh, that a lot of people were trying to make a nexus with, and I couldn't find it. One looked to me to be a burglary with a mass person. They were over five hours away. Um, one involved the victim was a Sandra Ladd, an individual. She was found at 4.30 on June 14th, not on June 13th. Um, so I couldn't find a nexus with those. I just think no is my answer. Okay. Um, and just so you know, a few people have messaged me because I've said it wrong a couple times. I guess the locals pronounce it Moscow, not Moscow. Um, Yes, you're right. Moscow. I've seen that Moscow. Mm -hmm. I think I think we've all just got um, like Russia on the mind too. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, wanted to address the dog, Brian. You and I and Paige. I don't know if you're a dog lover. Brian and I are huge dog lovers. Yes, I am. I yeah. So there's the dog. Yeah, the dog was apparently there. It was um, wasn't it uh. It was Kaylee's dog? Kaylee's dog with uh, Jack. They were co-owners. Yeah. And apparently, so th this was on the, um, this was, well, no, this wasn't in the room of control, but Paige, tell us what we know. Basically, I mean, I think the short end of it was the dog was there during the brutal. Yeah, unharmed, oh, I mean. unharmed and at the residence, um, according to police, which then it it went with animal control and then it went back with a, a, with a owner who would, care from i believe jack may have the dog at this point uh yeah but, i saw a yeah. photo another outlet had a photo of of jack 
uh, and it's raised a lot uh, more you know jennifer did a great job pointing out you know how fast this all happens but that's been a lot of question a lot of the questions on a lot of people's minds is that like for those of us who who have dogs or have had dogs and i know i used to have a golden retriever and someone came a step from that door and that golden retriever would go nuts a lot of people are wondering did the dog bark if not why not uh raising that sort of question as well yeah i mean it's a good question uh you know i've got three dogs only one of them is a barker the other two like literally never bark i mean they so maybe the dog might just not be a barker um but it is an interesting question. I mean, I, yeah, I think it just goes back to the whole question of, you know, how did this happen with other people in the house? You know, it, what do you think, Jennifer? I, I think that there has been a lot made about the dog. But to your point, it could not be a darker barker. A. B. The other, or, you know, the roommates were all in their rooms locked and they'd been out all night long up into the wee hours of the morning. So likely very fast asleep. Uh, by all accounts, they had consumed some alcohol, which causes people to deep sleep even deeper. And then a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I'll hear my dog, dog bark in the middle of the night for a short amount of time. And then they stop barking. I don't really think that much of it, you know, right. if, it's a, if it's a quick bark. So, um, I think uh, I, I think there is a lot made out of it, and I'm not sure how much is really there to be made out of it. This was not, by the way, a Rottweiler or a German Shepherd. <laughs> it was a sweet little, it looks like a little golden doodle or something. Well, Mama Bear 129 on Twitter just asked in reference to this, which is kind of, uh, first I thought it was a weird question, but then I'm like, no, it makes sense. Did the forensics test the dog? We, knows that we know that dogs get into everything, might have picked up DNA. Actually, someone else is asking that now, too. More, It sounds morbid, but did the dog have blood on him? I mean, it, it's kind of a... Uh, I'm just thinking again about my dogs. Like, you know, they would have jumped on the bed or come to investigate me if I had just, you know? Yeah, it's it's not clear at all where that dog was other than at the house. Was it in Kaylee's room? Was it, right. you know, did Kaylee sleep with Maddie? You know, I'm still not convinced that Kaylee was in her separate room. They haven't disclosed that. We know Matt, Kaylee had a room. We know she was really just back to visit and show off her uh, new car that she had just bought. Um, so that that even that's confusing. You know, you're in bed. You're, it's late at night. You're, you know, calling, you know, your ex-boyfriend uh, multiple times. And it's possible they were just in there jabbering and fell asleep and that it was really just two locations we're talking about we yeah. don't know but it's a possibility right. yeah like you said the dog could have been kept out in a different area or something um someone asked me this i don't know much about this maybe Paige or, or or jennifer maybe you know what this is um i'd like someone to speak about geofence warrants i believe they may have played a huge role do you know what a geofence warrant is jennifer i'm gonna let you take that one yeah i don't even know what that is um, I, if the, I mean, it could be a different vernacular than I'm used to, but I, I'm wondering, are they referring to, and maybe you can text them back or, or message okay. them back if they're referring to the, uh, warrants pertaining to any and all, uh, cell phone usage that occurred between those hours in that, uh, location. Yeah. Okay. And, and they have, they have done that a warrant for any and all, you know, cell phone pings from all phones in that location. And I think that that is going to yield uh, hopefully some, some answers. Um, so Vern Gilbert, who's a, who's a um, helped us before with cases uh, sent targeted attack stalker person. It thinks it's personal, brutal knife. Uh, could it be jealous, vindictive killer may have already left the area. Will they return after the holiday break? Killer may talk about the targeted individual at some point in a jealous manner um again i go back to this school being back monday um and there was even one family member i saw say something to the effect of like you know this this killer could go there's this vigil happening this week um like jennifer what is your i mean 
what is your take on whether people should be worried to go back to school? I mean, you don't want to just like stop your life because something like this happened. But at the same time, do you think it's a legit concern? You know, I have two college age uh, children and I wouldn't want them back. I would be insistent that they take their classes here, not because I think that there's a uh, serial killer on the loose. It's because I think that there's killer on the loose, someone who is capable of this sort of rage and targeted vendetta. What happens when somebody else uh, angers them to this point? So yeah. from that point, so yeah, I, I think you could possibly go back to quite a ghost town uh, there, Brian, uh, because it doesn't make really any sense um, to be on that campus in this situation until they find this guy. Someone asked, what do you think about the skin dog slaughtering just days prior and only down the road? That's actually addressed by the police as one of the rumors. Um, they say that detectives are aware of a report of a skin dog, but do not believe there's any evidence to support it is related in this incident. But then they say contact the sheriff's office for further details. Um, so they're clearly trying to squash some of the rumors. But at the same time, you do have to wonder like how, how they're able to so quickly squash some of these rumors. Like, How do they know that all of this stuff isn't connected? Well, with that dog situation, which I thought was about two weeks prior, but it, it doesn't matter. Nevertheless, there was a, definitely some sort of animal mutilation. And the sheriff's office handled that. Uh, case. And it they have, I believe, found out who did it. And they know the circumstances and they know the situation. And that's why they've determined it's not related. Remember, they have officers working around the clock, weekends, nights, in that command post. Um, having run these command posts, it, it's amazing. People don't even want to leave when their shift is over you know, they become so invested and they're ready for the next lead that they're going to go out and, and clear. And, and so I, I'm not surprised with the onslaught, uh, onslaught of manpower that they're able to resolve some of these. Um, sorry, I'm just reading through some comments here. No, that's okay. I'll take, I'll ask Jennifer a question while you do okay. that, Brian. Um, you know, a lot of attention is going to be on this vigil that's coming up this week. Um, and if this continues to remain unsolved, we know police are likely profiling this killer. Jennifer, I know you've been doing a little bit of that yourself with your experience, but what do you think the chances are that whoever is out there goes to this vigil this week? I think it's possible. Um, people who commit these types of crimes, they really want to be kept sort of in the know. I mean, this is somebody that's going to be tracking and looking at what law enforcement is doing. They're watching it as close as the cyber sleuths on here. And, um, you know, all of us have been watching it and looking and, and reading. And so it would not surprise me. And we hear the Remember, terms pro they're not gonna have. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say they are not going to have remorse. Right. Unless they get caught. <laughs> you know, then they're more remorseful. They got caught. But, you know, then you might see some sort of uh, feigned remorse. But they think these people, this person, not these people, this person deserved it. Right. Um, we hear the term, you know, profile of a killer. They're profiling a killer all the time. But for those of us without, you know, FBI experience, can you walk through exactly what that looks like and how you do that? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, I am not. A I want to make it clear. I'm not a certified profiler. That wasn't what I did. I'm an agent investigator. Right. You know, with homicide investigations and drugs and cartels and things like that. But in my cases as the case agent, I often would uh, reach out to BAU and work hand in hand with a profile. Pro profiler. I'll give you one quick example, right? So it was right after 9-11 and we had somebody that was stalking uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, uh, people, airplanes, tugs, uh, riding Osama bin Laden is the best, uh, you know, down with the U.S., I hate America, literally riding it on cockpit windows on tugs on they so they had access to the inner what we call the airport operations area of an airport right so i took all of those sayings 
I had absolutely no leads. I, you know, I could not figure out who this was. I sent everything they had written and how it, they wrote it. They stamped it. I sent everything to the behavioral science unit. They came back and they said, you are looking for a male. He's going to be Caucasian. He's going to be the age it's between the ages of 40 and 50. He's going to have a blue collar job. He's going to work in and around that airport. Uh, he's going to be former military. Uh, he's going to have uh, children who are probably in the military. They pinned it down perfectly. So here I'm thinking I'm looking for a whole different ballgame. And they give you a beautiful um, report. And then you work with them as you're working the case. You say, okay, well, I found out this. And then they they plug that into their analysis. And uh, I've worked, I've had three cases specifically where I needed a profiler and all three times they were perfectly on point. Wow. Well, that's interesting. Um, well, hopefully they'll be on it this time too, you know? Yeah. And the police have that. They were there, I think, within day one, two agents from BAU, you know, our behavioral uh, analysis unit uh, from Quantico. And uh, I, I believe that within, I mean, I got mine returned within maybe 24 hours, 48 hours. This is, they do it very quickly because they see this all the time. They see these different cases. And so um, I think the police have a very clear outline of the type uh, of all those details I just gave, according to BAU. Another interesting question that I just got, has forensics been able to isolate the killer's DNA how have the suspects been ruled out thus far? Has it been via DNA, alibi, or something else? Do you think because that of you... the... sorry, sorry, Brian? No, no, go ahead. Because of the quickness of it all, it has to be alibi. the The DNA uh, is going to take some time. I mean, and there could be other, you know, blood and and you know, obviously there's going to be hair, there's going to be fibers, there's going to be so much there. And they need to figure out what's even relevant. Um, but with the blood, you know, mostly it's going to be victim blood. And all, all we can hope for, which often happens in these types of killings, is that they accidentally stab themselves with the knife, you know, just brush themselves or prick themselves enough to cause blood to mingle. And then you have, it's not that it can't be done. It's very difficult to distinguish the DNA markers uh, at the lab. And I could tell you DNA, it takes a long time. It just does, even with the rush that this is going to have on it. Some people, this is kind of a weird take on it, but some someone is telling me they feel the vigil is to bring people back to campus for crowd footage. That doesn't seem right, though. Right? I mean, I think the, I mean, we've seen the university talk about the vigil. They want to remember the vigil. I mean, that, that wouldn't be some kind of tactic by law enforcement, would it? I don't think it's a tactic, but I think they're going to use it. I think there'll be agents there. I think there'll be a BAU, you know, behavioral analysis unit agents there watching. And um, I think all of that will be happening, but I don't think it's a ploy by them. So you think they'll have like undercover people at the vigil? Oh, yeah. Really? Yes. Interesting. That's what you need to focus on, Brian. <laughs> yeah, we'll be there. So, yeah. That'll, yeah, I didn't even think about that. I mean, I obviously knew that, I mean, it, it just made sense to me that they would have a vigil for the sake of, you know, bringing the community together. But um, you, I mean, I can't remember what case it was. It was an old one, but, and you mentioned it earlier, Jennifer, there have been situations where a killer will come back to a vigil to watch the emotion, or I've heard stories of, um, you know, serial arsonists who then, you know, like to come and watch as people, as the fire department arrives, um, I guess it wouldn't be out of the question that whoever did this would be kind of lurking around. Well, it's different than a serial killer. A serial killer has more uh, demonic right? This would be somebody, I think, more trying to blend in so they don't call attention to themselves, uh, someone who is trying to find out anything they can hear about rumors who they think it might be, you know, that wouldn't be why a serial killer, a serial killer would be there for more of a joyful 
piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just sick to even think about regardless it's whether sick. it's a killer, you know? Um, anything else you think is important, Jennifer, that we haven't covered? I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, I, I hate to speculate so much, just, um, but there is just so little information right now that's being released. It's, it's hard not to sort of, you know, talk about potential theories um, just because there's, you know, there's so much possibility still about what could have actually happened. Well, I think the main thing is, you know, when the coroner came out in this case, and it did remind me a little bit of in the Gabby Petito case where the coroner came out quite early um, and made some statements uh, that were, of course, ended up being quite remarkable. But this coroner said some very important things. And when I first listened to the coroner say about the knife, and they said, uh, well, what, you know, I think they asked something about, is there more than one weapon or something like that? And she off the, you know, very quickly says, oh, this was the same knife, but then she kind of holds back. Those weren't her, his, her exact words, but she just says, well, it would have been the same style knife. Right then I knew most likely we have one killer mm. because you have one knife. So y- y- you'll have to listen to that, Brian, but it's very she realizes she catches herself because that's a clue. I'm sure they didn't, you know, necessarily want out, but I think it's, and I think that's why law enforcement refers to him as being a guy and, and one, you know, and this, they're was, not from the cor- this was from the coroner who said that. Yeah. The coroner, if you listen, I think they gave two, re- two uh, interviews and it's in the first one, I believe where they say that. Um, but there's there's some clues to be gained by that. Also, that you know that they were sleeping, which is totally explains what is sort of unexplainable otherwise, right? How could people sleep through all this? Well, you can sleep through it all when everybody's asleep and they're ambushed and they have no chance to fight. Yeah, yeah Brian, yeah. that's what the coroner said to Ashley Banfield last week. That that they were sleeping. I mean, I knew were, they were uh, sleeping, but that came up were, in the coroner interview. They were sleeping, and then when Ashley followed up and said, you know, in beds, were they found in beds? The answer was yes. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of questions about were they in individual beds and where in the house and different sorts of, sorts of things, and we don't know the answer to that. But when Ashley asked if they were found in beds, the coroner did say yes. What yes. about the knife? And I'll wrap it up soon. I know everybody doesn't have a ton of time, but I, they've been sort of generic about the description of the knife, right? I mean, it's not like we, we haven't seen a picture of it or anything. Well, they don't have the knife, so I guess they wouldn't have a picture. But do they just know based on the wounds? Is that how they're coming up with this basic description? Yes. Yeah. It, I, I. Yes, exactly so. Um, this is a fixed edge, meaning it's not uh, or a fixed blade. This is you know, not a pocket knife. This is not a butter knife. This is not a, a steak knife. This is a, a, you know, fixed blade knife. And uh, we haven't seen exactly what it looks like, but I can tell you this law enforcement has a rendition of what they believe that knife looks like because they're able to conclude that from the wounds just based on, on on pictures from the autopsy and that sort of thing? Yes, they're going to see how, um, you know, how large the area is where that knife goes in, uh, the length of the laceration, yeah. the depth of the lacerations, and they're going to be able to tell a lot about that knife. Anything else in closing, Paige, you think that we should cover? I think I think you guys have done a really good job um, hitting hitting the main facts here. I think it's just you know police are missing something, right? That's why they're continuing to ask for information. No piece is too big, or too small, or too irrelevant. Um, I think they're getting close, but I think they need something to complete the puzzle. So I think just keeping the word out about uh, you know I sound like a broken record, but that that grid that area that they're looking for where they're asking you to send anything that they have um, I think they think what's in that area is going to be able to crack this yeah it's interesting you said that because you texted me that earlier too that you think just based on you covering this from the beginning that um that you think they're getting close I don't know why I just I, I don't want to be cynical but 
I, just based on everything I've read, I don't necessarily get that. I don't not get that feeling, but I don't strongly get that feeling. What do you, I mean, do you think that Jennifer? I don't think they're close. I, I think that the biggest reason why they're not close is this crime scene that they're trying to make their way through is just huge. And I think the amount of tips is overwhelming. And I think the witnesses and the, the, the information, the digital information from all these phones and, you know, computers. And I just, I just shudder to think about it actually, because I know how hard it is and how much manpower and how many hours. Um, and so, like I said, because I think it's not an inner circle person, it's somebody more on the peripheral. That's why they haven't been able to hone in because they're going to start with the people closest and work their way out. And they're already getting out outside yeah yeah it's gonna i mean i gosh i hope i hope that that this is the week and that you know i i just uh, as you mentioned earlier both jennifer and Paige, i always think of the families first and the victims and that's mm -hmm. what it's really about and so um you know for a lot of us it's just a mystery and a case that we get interested in but for them it's their family members so i hope um that for their sake it uh you know there's some kind of resolution this week and um, I look forward to going tomorrow. You know, I know that there's a ton of um, theories and, and people go down rabbit holes. And, you know, we really try um, at News Nation and, and me, you know, I just try to be fact based. And I know that sometimes, um, you know, maybe that's not as entertaining, but that's just the way we do it. And, um, you know, we're just going to stick to the facts. And, and, and one other thing, like people will message me theories or things that they found interesting or that they found online. And like, we do look into all of that or we send it to police or we, you know, just because we don't include that in reports doesn't mean that we haven't seen it or that I haven't seen it. It's just like, we we're really just focused on what we, what we know for sure. So. Um, and that's I, what I was going to say, Brian, like for me, the, the, my closing message would be just that is that you know even as we talked about this we're not talking about you know casting uh, a theory on who did this we're yeah. just talking about what the evidence that we have right now gleans you know can can we can glean from it um but it's all about the facts and i just think it's terrible i agree with you when people cast dispersions on people being involved in something this heinous the police will get there i do believe that brian yeah. i do believe they'll solve this and i just think it is so unhelpful uh to guesswork at who did this horrible crime yeah without people fact. on social media have a lot of power i mean it's not like the old days where you know just if something was on the news um you know it became public i mean when people on social media you know, bully one person or, or think that they're involved and they actually aren't, it can really, you know, do a lot of damage. Again, I just, I always feel for those people. Um, but, you know, I, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see how all of this turns out. And again, I'll be, um, I'll be on the road tomorrow and we'll, we'll start our reports on News Nation on Monday. Um, it'll be interesting with, with school starting again. We'll be at the vigil and just trying to dig up anything we can during the week of course, while, you know, being respectful of law enforcement. So thank you, Jennifer and Paige. I, I'm really appreciative of you both, um, you know, for coming on today and also just personally for for being my friends and always there for me and, and helping out with these stories and stuff. So thank you guys. Absolutely. This was my Spaces debut. It I was. I couldn't believe I got the invite. I couldn't believe I, I got the invite to join. I mean, have you ever even heard Paige's voice, Jennifer? I mean, she's have, like always I don't lurking think anyone behind the hears. scenes. Oh, Jennifer hears my voice because I'm always in her ear saying, hi, Jennifer, from the control room. Um, yeah, so I hear, I've heard Paige's voice. But yeah, Paige, she gave it's me nice a hard time. I was like, I'm going to do a space with Jennifer. I'm like, can you do it too? Because she's like obsessed with the case and always talking about every little detail. And she's like, you want me to do it? I'm like, <laughs> duh, like you know everything about it, you know? <laughs> I am always silently working behind the scenes. So anyway, all right. Well, we'll try to do another one of these soon. And um, everybody have a good rest of the weekend. And uh, we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Jennifer, everybody. Jennifer, let's for... get you on News Nation this week, okay? Okay. Thanks, Paige. And thanks, <laughs> and all everybody in Twitter, for all these wonderful 
questions and everything. Thanks a yeah, lot. We, we love everybody. Thank you guys. Sorry I wasn't able to like let people talk. It just became over. I'm, I need like to be better with the spaces. It just became overwhelming figuring out who was who. So next time we'll try to make that work. But all right, guys. Talk to you guys later. Thanks, guys. All right, bye. Bye.